He said nothing when he entered. I was passing the best of my razors back and forth on a strop. When I recognized him, I started to tremble. But he didn't notice. Hoping to conceal my emotion, I continued sharpening the razor. I tested it on the meat of my thumb and then held it up to the light. At that moment, he took off the bullet-studded belt that his gun holster dangled from. He hung it up on a wall hook and placed his military cap over it. Then he turned to me, loosening the knot of his tie, and said, It's hot as hell. Give me a shave. He sat in the chair. I estimated he had a four-day beard. The four days taken up by the latest expedition in search of our troops. His face seemed reddened, burned by the sun. Carefully, I began to prepare the soap. I cut off a few slices, dropped them into the cup, mixed in a bit of warm water, and began to stir with the brush. Immediately, the foam began to rise. The other boys in the group should have this much beard, too. I continued stirring the lather. But we did all right, you know. We got the main ones. We brought back some dead, and we've got some others still alive. But pretty soon, they'll all be dead. How many did you catch? I asked. Fourteen. We had to go pretty deep into the woods to find them. But we'll get even. Not one of them comes out of this alive. Not one. He leaned back on the chair when he saw me with the lather-covered brush in my hand. I still had to put the sheet around him. No doubt about it, I was upset. I took a sheet out of a drawer and knotted it around my customer's neck. He wouldn't stop talking. He probably thought I was in sympathy with his party. The town must have learned a lesson from what we did the other day, he said. Yes, I replied, securing the knot at the base of his dark, sweaty neck. That was a fine show, eh? Very good, I answered, turning back for the brush. The man closed his eyes with a gesture of fatigue and sat waiting for the cool caress of the soap. I had never had him so close to me. The day he ordered the whole town to file into the patio of the school to see the four rebels hanging there, I came face to face with him for an instant. But the sight of the mutilated bodies kept me from noticing the face of the man who had directed it all, the face I was now about to take into my hands. It was not an unpleasant face, certainly. And the beard, which made him seem a bit older than he was, didn't suit him badly at all. His name was Torres, Captain Torres, a man of imagination because who else would have thought of hanging the naked rebels and then holding target practice on certain parts of their bodies? I began to apply the first layer of soap. With his eyes closed, he continued, Without any effort, I could go straight to sleep, he said, but there's plenty to do this afternoon. I stopped lathering and asked with a feigned lack of interest, A firing squad? Something like that, but a little slower. I got on with the job of lathering his beard. My hands started trembling again. The man could not possibly realize it, and this was in my favor, but I would have preferred that he hadn't come. It was likely that many of our faction had seen him enter and an enemy under one's roof imposes certain conditions. I would be obliged to shave that beard like any other one, carefully, gently, like that of any customer, taking pains to see that no single pore emitted a drop of blood, being careful to see that the little tufts of hair did not lead the blade astray, seeing that his skin ended up clean, soft, and healthy so that passing the back of my hand over it, I couldn't feel a hair. Yes, I was secretly a rebel, but I was also a conscientious barber, and proud of the preciseness of my profession. And this four days' growth of beard was a fitting challenge. 
I took the razor, opened up the two protective arms, exposed the blade and began the job, from one of the sideburns downward. The razor responded beautifully. His beard was inflexible and hard, not too long, but thick. Bit by bit, the skin emerged. The razor rasped along, making its customary sound as fluffs of lather mixed with bits of hair gathered along the blade. I paused a moment to clean it, then took up the strop again to sharpen the razor, because I'm a barber who does things properly. The man, who had kept his eyes closed, opened them now, removed one of his hands from under the sheet, felt the spot on his face where the soap had been cleared off, and said, Come to the school today at six o'clock. The same thing as the other day? I asked, horrified. It could be better, he replied. What do you plan to do? I don't know yet, but we'll amuse ourselves. Once more he leaned back and closed his eyes. I approached him with the razor poised. Do you plan to punish them all? I ventured timidly. All. The soap was drying on his face. I had to hurry. In the mirror, I looked toward the street. It was the same as ever, the grocery store with two or three customers in it. Then I glanced at the clock, 2.20 in the afternoon. The razor continued on its downward stroke, now from the other side burned down, a thick blue beard. He should have let it grow like some poets or priests do. It would suit him well. A lot of people wouldn't recognize him. Much to his benefit, I thought, as I attempted to cover the neck area smoothly. There, for sure, the razor had to be handled masterfully, since the hair, although softer, grew into little swirls. A curly beard. One of the tiny pores could be opened up and issue forth its pearl of blood. A good barber such as I prides himself on never allowing this to happen to a client. And this was a first-class client. How many of us had he ordered shot? How many had he ordered mutilated? It was better not to think about it. Torres did not know that I was his enemy. He did not know it, nor did the rest. It was a secret shared by very few, precisely so that I could inform the revolutionaries of what Torres was doing in the town, and of what he was planning each time he undertook a rebel hunting excursion. So it was going to be very difficult to explain that I had him right in my hands and let him go peacefully, alive and shaved. The beard was now almost completely gone. He seemed younger, less burdened by years than when he had arrived. I suppose this always happens with men who visit barber shops. Under the stroke of my razor, Torres was being rejuvenated. Rejuvenated because I am a good barber, the best in town, if I may say so. A little more lather here, under his chin, on his Adam's apple, on this big vein. How hot it is getting. Torres must be sweating as much as I. But he is not afraid. He is a calm man who is not even thinking about what he is going to do with the prisoners this afternoon. On the other hand, I, with this razor in my hands, stroking and re-stroking this skin, trying to keep blood from oozing from these pores, can't even think clearly. Damn him for coming, because I'm a revolutionary and not a murderer. And how easy it would be to kill him. And he deserves it. Does he? No. What the devil? No one deserves to have someone else make the sacrifice of becoming a murderer. What do you gain by it? Nothing. Others come along, and still others, and the first ones kill the second ones, and they the next one, and it goes on and on like this until everything is a sea of blood. I could cut his throat just so, zip, zip. I wouldn't give him time to complain, and since he has his eyes closed, he wouldn't see the glistening blade or my glistening eyes. But I'm trembling like a real murderer. Out of his neck, a gush of blood would spout onto the sheet, on the chair, on my hands on the floor, I would have to close the door, and the blood would keep inching along the floor, warm, ineradicable, uncontainable, until it reached the street like a little scarlet stream. I'm sure that one solid stroke, one deep incision would prevent any pain. He wouldn't suffer. But what would I do with the body, 
Where would I hide it? I would have to flee, leaving all I had behind and take refuge far away, far, far away. But they would follow until they found me. Captain Torres is murderer. He slit his throat while he was shaving him. A coward. And then on the other side, the avenger of us all, a name to remember. And here they would mention my name. He was the town barber. No one knew he was defending our cause. And what of all this, murderer or hero? My destiny depends on the edge of this blade. I can turn my hand a bit more, press a little harder on the razor, and sink it in. The skin would give way like silk, like rubber, like the strop. There is nothing more tender than human skin, and the blood is always there, ready to pour forth. A blade like this doesn't fail. It is my best. But I don't want to be a murderer, no, sir. You came to me for a shave, and I perform my work honorably. I don't want blood on my hands. Just lather, that's all. You are an executioner, and I am only a barber. Each person has his own place in the scheme of things. That's right, his own place. Now his chin had been stroked clean and smooth. The man sat up and looked into the mirror. He rubbed his hands over his skin and felt it fresh, like new. Thanks, he said. He went to the hangar for his belt, pistol, and cap. I must have been very pale. My shirt felt soaked. Torres finished adjusting the buckle, straightened his pistol in the holster, and after automatically smoothing down his hair, he put on the cap. From his pants pocket, he took out several coins to pay me for my services and he began to head toward the door. In the doorway, he paused for a moment, and turning to me, he said, They told me that you'd kill me. I came to find out. But killing isn't easy. You can take my word for it. And he headed on down the street.